Hiya, buddies. Welcome to Barn Burner here on uh, the YouTubes in your ear holes, wherever you're. Maybe you're at the lake. Maybe you're uh, you're on the treadmill. Maybe you're, I hope you're enjoying yourself wherever you are today. As you can tell, Barn Burner changing things up a little bit for the summertime. If the you know what, if the hockey, if they're not going to do the hockey, then we're not going to do the thing. But what we're, I I really like a lot of what we're going to roll out for you here today, obviously, and in the coming days and weeks, we've had, we're still going to do our normal shows. I told you all that we, you know, what's going on, but some longer form interviews. And if it, it's weird to call them, it's just conversation. That's why I really like this forum, this format where you can just sit down and kind of, you can just chat and, and no interruptions and just kind of go, go in deep on, on some things. And if it's not that deep, then we're not that deep characters, but we'll, uh, this this is a good one here. Um, it, it, when I say good, it's 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 compelling. It's tragedy. I said yes. I said in the last episode off the top that Robin Regeer, former Flame, just seems like your prototypical Canadian hockey story. Here's a guy that was you know he's from Saskatchewan, plays for the Blazers and Kamloops, gets drafted in the first round, goes on to play in the NHL, and da 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 da. Except that's not it. And, if you missed it, I definitely recommend you go back and hear it. A guy born in Brazil, lived in Indonesia. What? This is not had no real kind of idea that he was in Indonesia for as long as he was. Then comes to Canada, and obviously, um, the rest, I guess, is history. Um, but today, it's it's it, the early days in Calgary, and rather than me blather on about it, um, a near death experience changes everything for Robin Regeer. One. Steamy Saskatchewan summer night, part two, right now with Robin Regeer. Barn Burner comes to you from the Tower Chrysler Studios. Tower Chrysler, voted Calgary Sun's Reader's Choice Award winner for Southern Alberta's favorite Dodge Chrysler dealer. We've been very lucky and proud to have had Tower as a Barn Burner partner since day number one as our studio sponsor and vehicle supplier. How great did the Nation Truck and Nation Jeep look? Tower Chrysler. 10901 McLeod Trail South at the corner of McLeod and Southport Road. Buffalo. It's funny how Buffalo just always drafted always. in Buffalo in 98. Four first round picks for Colorado. Mm -hmm. Alex Tangay, Martin Skula, Robin Regeer, Scott Parker, Parker yeah. Sheriff. That, and, you know, there's not a lot out there of you as a Colorado Avalanche. And we'll talk about that because the trade happens. But you were at the draft. So there's the pick to the four of you guys in your crisp mm -hmm. jerseys, love and life. What do you remember about draft day in Buffalo? Yeah, uh, family was there uh, sharing in the experience, which was uh, which was nice. Um, I guess leading up to it, I did a lot of a lot of interviews. Um, so even flew out flew out to uh, New York for the Islanders. Uh, flew to Chicago uh, for that. Uh, a bunch of interviews pre pre draft. Uh, there were some funny ones too. The Rangers, uh, Glenn Sather was in the room, and all the scouts and assistant GMs and everyone is around. And you walk in, and I walked in the room, and he Glenn comes up to me right away. Uh, hey, Darcy, nice to meet you, and shakes my hand and sits down. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, uh, and then one of the guys in the room, uh, hey, Glenn, uh, that's that's Robin. Uh, he. He uh, mistaken me for Darcy Regeer. Yeah. yeah, so so I knew I wasn't getting drafted to the Rangers. <laughs> <laughs> Cross that one off the yeah. list. Um, but yeah, just some, uh, you know, the comp, they, I guess they started, the, they didn't call it, I don't think, the combine then, but we'd, we'd done that to all the fitness testing, things like that. They, po they poke and probe and It's and funny because they that. got better at it. Sorry to interrupt you, but like speaking to the learning, it wasn't really called they called it the combine workouts but they did it re, like just little pockets we did the saskatoon on like a tuesday morning after the may long weekend in which chad allen and i had been in northern saskatchewan yeah. fishing and drinking all weekend and like tuesday morning at seven you were on the bike and i'm puking and i'm like oh, yeah. <laughs> like this was the, you, <laughs> again naive yeah. and yeah. dumb yeah. but yeah. weird yeah. hey yeah. Hey, Rhett, you want to come to Florida? No, uh, I like it up here. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, just kind of leading up to it was some very cool experiences. Um, that way, you know, getting a chance to travel, um, things like that, being a limo, right? The Islanders sent me a limo to the airport and they're sitting there by yourself in the back of the limo on the way to the hotel. 
Uh, like, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. just first time. Yeah. And so really enjoyed it. Um, the draft, uh, I knew the Islanders were really interested, um, but they actually, and they drafted early, uh, but they decided to go with Mike Rupp. Um, and they, they viewed him as kind of a little riskier pick. I was a safe pick, uh, but they found more upside to him. So yeah. uh, thank goodness I didn't uh, get drafted to that dumpster fire uh, on the island because that would have been just awful. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Colorado, yeah, they had they had four first rounders. Uh, they were locked in and just very good teams, but intense battles with Detroit usually um, in, in the Western Conference there. Um, you know, you mentioned the four first rounders. Uh, my my older brother actually saw I was getting drafted to Colorado first because uh, they had uh, Velcro name bars. And so uh, I was nervous and kind of not paying attention. But Dean, you actually saw them put the Velcro name bar on the back of yeah. the jersey before they ag- went up and and uh, announced it. So, uh, yeah, I was just, I was really excited. Um, and you know, went to camp later on. And, and for me, like, it's kind of funny how things work out a little bit of luck, but, uh, they had great teams and they had no room for hardly anyone. Um, especially for kind of a player like, Mm -hmm. like me. Uh, so I ended up getting traded, um, to Calgary after, after I'd gone to training camp, went back to Kamloops and, uh, I got traded. My rights were traded in the Theron Fleury trade. So Theo Fleury, Chris Dingman, uh, to Colorado, I think right around the deadline for Rennie Corbet, Wade Belak, and future considerations. And the future considerations were uh, Calgary had one month to scout uh, Martin Skula or myself. That was that was it. They couldn't uh, go after anyone else on the protected list from Colorado. So it was between us two, and. Uh, and we had a good team in in Kamloops, and Did my you know agent when phoned you were me. Playing in Kamloops, that you were one of the two being considered. Yes, my agent phoned me at at the time, and he said, "You're you're one of the players that they're they're yeah. going to be looking at. Don't worry, just do what you're doing, go play hard." Um, and after a month, uh, they they phoned me and said, "You know, we we chose chose you. Mm-hmm. Uh, we ended up playing, I think, the Hitmen that year in the in the." Um, in the league final, oh, we lost yeah. to the Hitmen there. They had uh, Brad Stewart, Pavel, Pavel Brendel, Fomachev was in that. They had a good good squad too. We just, I think we lost in like six games or something like that. It was a tough, tough slog. But uh, yeah, I was excited because Calgary had a, had a very weak team, uh, even though they had the young guns here. Yeah, um, yeah. They had a weak team and there was going to be opportunity. And I think I, 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 I didn't realize that initially. Uh, but I was very excited when I thought about it a little bit more that it, I'd actually have a chance to to play in Calgary at a at a, at a much younger age sure. and play like play significant minutes if um, I, I made the team and that's the way that you're going to improve. You're not going to improve by just sitting on the bench. So um, the trade actually worked out really well. Um, another little fun fact part of that trade uh, was actually the draft pick ended up being Jared Stoll. So the flames uh, drafted Stoll. I think it was second yeah, round or something like that. Then he didn't sign and then him. he couldn't, si- they didn't sign him because of money, I believe. And then he went to Edmonton yeah. and then Edmonton had uh, Lombardi. Matthew Lombardi who they couldn't sign. So then Lombardi came, came yeah. down here and then, you know, you end up playing with, with uh, most of these guys as the career kind of, yeah. progresses you get to know most of them play yeah. play with most of them which uh which is really kind of kind of funny and interesting yeah. so what were you thinking when colorado wins the cup in 2001 like, you know you know i knew i wasn't i wasn't really going to play yeah. there anyway and so i i was okay with 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 it really like i was coming coming to calgary where, where i'd actually have an opportunity and i was more excited about that and yeah we were we were bad. Like we were awful here when I, when I first got here, the save the flames campaign was going on maybe nine, 10,000 people. I could get as many tickets as I possibly wanted from, from the flames for a game, you know, and I'd, I'd have my brother who's uh, in nursing back with, uh, you know, in nursing with like 30 other girls in his class. I think he was the only guy That's and wrong. he'd show up. Yeah. He'd show up with like, six of them for the weekend yeah we're just coming to calgary like can you get us <laughs> get us a bunch of tickets yeah no problem yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah whatever like yeah. oh it was yeah it was it was really really funny we we had a 
we had a fun time and and you know you look back on it and mom and dad could come watch pretty much any game they they wanted uh within reason as long as they could make it work with uh with uh, work commitments and stuff like that so they came and watched lots of games so being nice and close it actually worked out uh quite well logistically uh, yeah, and too. then they're not bunking into the house for a month at a time either yeah yeah fly over yeah, yeah. say hi catch a game oh yeah to go. like they were crazy hockey committed parents like they they'd come out for a weekend of Kamloops and turn around drive home and same thing here oh well we really want to watch this game and they'd drive out and turn around drive home right after home. like yeah, it was just yeah it was nuts I think uh gummy bears and jolt was uh gummy <laughs> bears and jolt if you remember that that, yeah. that was oh, yeah. my dad's secret secret recipe yeah, yeah. really good for you yeah I see yeah really diet. good yeah before that though um July 4th 1999 what can you tell us about that day? Yeah, so um, one of, uh, you know, speaking of adversity, uh, probably some of the biggest adversity I've I've ever faced uh, in in life. So we'd spent the day uh, out at Blackstrap, actually just south of uh, south of Saskatoon. And uh, my grandparents had a, had a boat, you know, nice little 16, 17 foot Starcraft. We'd been out there uh, water skiing with friends. Uh, my older brother, Dean, you myself and uh two two girls natalie and stephanie um from rostern and on the way back we dropped the boat back off at my grandparents place and we phoned uh phoned mom and dad said you know we'll be home in 40 minutes and and off we went i was driving my 19 my restored 1976 nova ss SS. uh four speed yep um and north of saskatoon so we're driving northbound and we were two kilometers off of the divided at that time. And uh, it right in between Warman and Osler. And there were two vehicles that were coming southbound. And as we passed the, the first vehicle, the vehicle right in behind that pulled out into our lane. There was absolutely nothing we could have done. Um, very fortunate that Dean you and I had our both had our seat belts on. The girls in the back did not have their seat. I think they were they were lap belts back then. It was probably beneficial they didn't have their lap belts on. Um, we hit head on on the highway, 1986 Ford Temple. No skid marks, no nothing. 110 kilometers an hour each way. Uh, I remember coming to uh, shortly after that, uh, I would say 10, 15 seconds after, with the fuel, uh, the smell of, of fuel, gas, oil, and fuel around. And my older brother had got out of the passenger side and come around and ripped the door open. One of those things that just superhuman strength at that point, because the the door, I, I went and looked at the car after, and it, it was about half the size the car was crumpling. And he ripped the door open and, and pulled me out. Uh, I remember kind of getting out and being pulled out, trying to stand and not being able to, and kind of rolling into the ditch and um, and waiting there after that. Uh, very nice uh, people stopped. Uh, people stopped on the highway, um, you know, brought some blankets, things like that. I was going into shock. Uh, very cold, shivering. Um, and after that, it was just a waiting game, waiting to, till the ambulance came. And um, the ambulance finally came. Dean was okay. I didn't know how, how Steph or Natalie were. Um, and then I get in the ambulance and and they, they put me in the ambulance and, and there was the front passenger from the other vehicle was in there as well. And uh, he died on the way to the hospital. Uh, and and I found out later that the driver of the 86 Ford Tempo died instantly. Um, what I also heard was that there were two girls in the back. So out of eight people in both vehicles, all 18 to 21 years old, um, two of them died. And uh, the, the girls in, in the back of their vehicle, I heard, had some serious injuries, but were okay and lived. It was probably the most difficult thing I've I've ever had to go through. Um, you kind of like I kind of thought as a 
18, 19 year old, you know everything in the world. And then you go through something like that. And it just, for me, it was actually a good reset on like, things can happen very quickly. And, uh, you know, these two people losing their lives, like it was a very sobering, um, very emotional uh, kind of ordeal. And one that, uh, thank goodness, I had great medical support. Dr. Ann Deuce put me back together again. I still got two screws in my left uh, tibia, uh, but she was fantastic. And she, she said, you know, you're lucky to be alive. You're, you're lucky that it didn't uh, sever your patella tendon. Uh, we kind of put you with the drill and the screws back together. Um, and I, you know, we're not sure uh, how things are going to, are going to kind of progress. Uh, but you're going to have early stage arthritis. You're going to have a bunch of stuff because of the trauma of, of your knees, but I was alive. And so, um, I felt lucky and probably one of the biggest reasons why, um, I, I really like when I had a chance to start my rehab and, and push it, uh, one where I didn't want to take any shortcuts. I didn't want to leave anything to chance. I, as soon as I got my foot in the door in Calgary, I was like, I want to make the most of this as a, as a 19 year old. Cause I was very close from having not just the dream taken away of playing in the NHL, but potentially your, your life, yeah. um, with that. So it was, um, it, it took me a while to realize that, uh, the injuries, the injuries physically, uh, were probably a little easier to heal from than the emotional or, or psychological issues that happened because of it and the different stages kind of that had to go through in order to get through that. Um, that wasn't a, that wasn't a, that's four to six weeks with a sprained shoulder. That was a, you know, you, you have to kind of accept what happened to you, uh, understand it, get over the why me, uh, you know, all like there's all those things that you kind of have to grind through and some days it's two steps forward one back and some days it was three steps back and maybe only one forward and there was no um there's no set timeline for something like that on when you're going to get through it but the the big thing for me was support network at that time was fantastic and uh everywhere from my my mom and dad to family to friends were coming through uh the hospital and all the way through to the house and just being around and being positive influences and that was massive every day on barn burner the pinder report is brought to you by village honda village honda has new hondas arriving daily and has a huge pre-owned inventory with over 70 used vehicles on site and access to over 400 more in their dealer group. All makes, all models, all budgets. It's award-winning service, a top-rated team. Village Honda is your dealership for life. Located in the Northwest Auto Mall and online at villagehonda.com. The Hearing Loss Clinic was opened in 1993 with a simple mission. Make a positive difference in the lives of our clients. It's never been about hearing loss or hearing impairment. It's been about empowering you to be socially active or more connected with loved ones and confident in every aspect of your life. Men and women of all ages, and of course, children can suffer from hearing loss too. There can be serious health risks that are linked to untreated hearing loss, and you can get a peace of mind at four Calgary locations, Shaughnessy, University District, Northwest in the Crowfoot Business Center, and in the North Hill Professional Offices. If you've got issues with your hearing, come visit one of their four Calgary locations for an evaluation. They're the 2022 Chamber of Commerce Professional Services Excellence Award winner. Visit one of their three locations in BC. You can find them at Cranbrook, Creston, Fernie, Golden, and Invermere. Famous people that have swung by the hearing loss clinic, John Huffnagel, Lanny McDonald, Haley Wickenheiser, Peter Marr. It's worked for them and it can work for you. Check out their social streams on Twitter at The Hearing Loss or on Instagram at The Hearing Loss Clinic. Was there any why not me? The guilt? Because I've heard people go through stuff like that and if they're the survivor, they almost have a guilt that they're 
how come I got through it and others didn't? Uh, I, I wouldn't say so for me. I, yeah. it was why, like, why did this happen to me? I was, and I, and I think I understand it now a little bit is that I, I was going, I was so singularly focused, um, uh, before that on, I want to make the NHL. Like I've got this opportunity in front of me and, uh, you know, people around me had been committed, mom and dad and, and, and uh, others, I had been committed, like I was hyper focused on this one single goal in life. And after that, like, there's a, there's some doubt, there's, there's doubt, there's, oh boy, like, life, like, not just this, this uh, dream that you have, or this goal, but you know, life can be taken away in, in the snap of fingers. If that was a, if that was an F-350 diesel yeah. that hit us, like I wouldn't be here talking to you guys right now. Like having to grind through some of that, I think was, was more difficult. I found than the, than the why not. It was, um, I I've gone from, you know, this with, with minimal distractions to now, uh, I've got lots going on and how, how can we get through it and how are my friends doing how, like all that kind of stuff. It becomes uh, a much bigger kind of issue, uh, to kind of get, get through rather than, well, I'm just going to go run 20 wind sprints today. And I've done you know, I it, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You talk about rehab and therapy. Did you have anything on that on the mental health side, because I just know when I was a kid, uh, my mom died when I was young and there was no talk of, you know, should you talk to somebody? How do you go through this? I just wonder for you, because it'd be so focused on your legs and your body and your career and all of that. But meanwhile, you're, that's as traumatic as it gets mentally. Did you have that kind of support? Uh, I, I had the support, not, um, not professionally, but like with, with friends and family yeah. around, like they were always around and, and talking about it. Like the biggest thing is to talk, is to talk about it, not stay silent. And I think you're seeing that with the push for, for mental health, uh, is, is let's talk about struggles. It's okay to struggle. Let's talk about it. And then from there, you know, maybe we can make a plan or, or figure something out and, and always having people around and, and talking about it was, was very helpful. Um, but also getting humbled, like, uh, uh, you know, my, my mom was an RN and, uh, my brother was, was kind of, uh, was working his way down that path too. Like there I am, like after surgery, um, you know, trying to take a bowel movement in, and my mom's like there right beside me, cheering me on as I'm sitting on this bedpan, like as a 18, 19 year old, that's humbling. That's humbling. <laughs> Very and it's a reset for sure. Oh, yeah. like and that's just one yeah. of those those things that yeah. that happen. Like so, um, I think those those things re like as tough as they were to kind of go through. I think they really really helped me in in the in the long run in in the big picture and and having kind of positive influences. Like I remember I was sitting in, so mom and dad had moved my bed. I, I got out of the hospital. I think it was after 10 or 12 days. Um, and, uh, they'd moved my bed to the main floor because it was hard to do, hard to do stairs. And, uh, SGI had, a had somebody at the house meeting with my parents at the dining room table to talk about the, what happened and, and also what my needs were, uh, moving forward. We had to modify the, the house with different railings for showers and getting around all that kind of stuff. And, uh, I had a friend there, uh, her name was Lisa Katernick and, and we were just talking. She was sitting beside my bed and we were talking, we were laughing, we were having a great time. And, and the insurance adjuster kept looking over at us and I, I kind of saw it, felt it and, and, and that, and, and after the adjuster left, and then Lisa left. I talked to my parents. I'm like, uh, what, what was going on? And my dad's in, was an insurance, right? Like that was, he was, he had an SGI, uh, business there and stuff like that. So, so, uh, they're like, well, normally they go in and you know, people want to make it look like Maybe. as bad and, and, and miserable as possible. And he's like, well, you, you were, you guys were having a great conversation, enjoying one another's company. He, 
just they're not used to that mm -hmm. like they're so having you don't realize it at the time but you you have those conversations after and you know you you realize that then after the fact that i was really lucky to have Boy. those type of people around and especially and, now as a parent don't you look back and appreciate how great your parents had to have been at that yeah. time oh yeah yeah you think about when they get the word of this accident with two of their kids yeah so crazy story with i i can't imagine so and i only learned this way after so they had to they had to actually come from rostron so rostron is north of the crash site yet like that's where we were going so so they had to come from north they were phoned by somebody at the accident uh, the crash scene knew us and knew my mom and dad so they phoned them um so we went south to saskatoon to royal university hospital um but they had to come through oh. there uh by the time mom and dad got there they had uh the police were there and they were uh, detouring people around on the grids uh but but dad actually uh said he stopped and he ran up and actually saw the the crash scene of the 86 ford tempo and the nova and I cannot imagine oh. uh, like that then drive after seeing a full head on and, and the two vehicles just pretty much crumpled messes. Um, that would have been a very, very difficult drive as a, as parents, you know, the, the 20 minutes to the hospital, Re really, really difficult with all those, all those things, um, bouncing around and your head and exactly and uncertainty after seeing that yeah. um you don't you don't wish that on on any parent and i don't know i'm trying to think back like not everyone was carrying a cell phone at that time either no. right so it wasn't a constant updating of how things were yeah. going right today's world you would be yeah. on the phone yeah. talking the whole way whereas then it was yeah so uh bit of a funny story this is a pretty serious subject but uh back to the communication uh fax machines were really big yeah. back then still yeah. and uh somehow someone leaked out because uh, this you know got some media attention um the severity of it and everything but the fax machine was actually uh the number of that that ward that we were on was was put out there oh. and the faxes started coming in and faxes from all over Western Canada, Canada, I had some friends in Hawaii at the time too that faxed in, but it was hundreds of faxes. Yeah. Like eventually it actually jammed up the lines <laughs> and, the, and eventually they were like asking like, please stop sending okay, faxes. Can. But it, that was another thing. Like, you know, as, as the day was on, you're in the hospital bed, uh, you know, mom or dad would bring in, you know, here are all the faxes and, you know, everything was written down and you go through the, the faxes and, stuff like that but that was the communication but right. that you know you realize like how many people care about you and are there to support you and it kind of helps you along the way i remember sitting in the paper i remember sitting at mom and dad's or where i grew up at the i was back for the summer and i was i hope they yeah. got the star phoenix and it was on i'm like holy this guy kid is gonna yeah. be effed yeah. did you ever have any connection with the family of the other two from the other car no uh so what happened was it took a uh, about a year um until after they released the uh the findings and the odd to like uh, uh tox yeah. toxicology and and all that kind of stuff be i think because first of all they wanted to do the proper job but also there was quite a bit of uh attention around it all uh what happened was they were at a party uh i knew some of uh through hockey i'd, I'd played with uh, uh, one of these guys that uh, was actually at that party um they were at a party in osler um and you know over the legal limit uh for alcohol um and uh decided to try to hop on the on the highway six kilometers to make it back to uh to warman so that's that's what happened it's time to discover or rediscover the legendary St. Eugene Golf Resort and Casino. Planning a golf trip, a romantic getaway, or maybe just some tranquility away from the city? St. Eugene is the answer. Hotel, championship golf course, casino, spa, restaurants, all of it nestled in the spectacular Rocky Mountains and just minutes outside of Cranbrook, B.C. Visit their website, st.eugene.ca, and experience the history and heritage 
of the St. Eugene Golf Resort and Casino. The original Bonton Meat Market opened its doors way back in 1921, and all they've done since then is provide the highest quality product and treat customers like family. The very best AAA Alberta beef, free-range poultry, grain-fed Alberta lamb, milk-fed veal, and fresh Alberta pork. Once again, Bonton was voted the Calgary Consumer Choice Award winner for Best Deli Meat Market. Find them at 28 Crowfoot Circle Northwest or go to bontonmeatmarket.com. You said you went to see the car, the Chevy Nova, the 76 Nova. You know, obviously, this is the magnitude of this accident. What was that like to see your car and the state of damage that it was in that day? Yeah, it was, it was hard. Uh, I think my mom cried. I, we were at the SGI salvage yard and, uh, I looked around it. It was, it was tough, but it was also like, I looked when I thought about it after like lucky, lucky there was a big old unibody car with a massive front end and a 350, uh, hanging out, out the front there. But what, what actually sticks in my mind is, uh, I looked at the rear quarter panels um and the rear quarter panels were uh, were creased uh up up above the the tire so the the car had had impacted so hard that you know really it was starting to squish accordion like yeah, yeah accordion like and and that so i'll, I'll never forget that with uh, you know with that car but uh, like i said you you think of oh man i'm lucky i had that car and we're lucky we didn't get hit by something bigger, you know, all that kind of stuff, kind yeah. of ping pongs around in, in your head. Driving by that spot the next time or ever since is it, it's got to kind of give you pause to a point. Yeah. Sleep, sleeping after that, like the first, I would say a couple of weeks, uh, were difficult. I'd, I'd see headlights coming, uh, right, right at me, yeah. you know, when you try to close your eyes and, and get to sleep and kind of go through some of that stuff. Um, driving by there was difficult. Good news now is it's all divided, right? They've changed all that now. It's all divided highway. So, uh, and and over time, by by speaking about it and and driving by there, uh, it kind of um, I don't know if you want. It kind of dulls the the feeling or uh, kind of soothes it. I'm not sure what the best way to put that is, but it, it, it does get uh, a little bit easier over, over time. Putting our back in the parent mindset, you're driven now to get my career. I'm not losing my career over this. I'm getting back on the ice. So the parents have to be like, just, would you please, just <laughs> please stop. You were on the ice less than two months later. Yeah, I think, uh, that was, that was July, or July 4th. And then, um, I think it was right near, uh, actually, I think it was right near end of August and I got some, uh, I got some ice out at, uh, out at Beardy's actually at the, at the rink out there. And, uh, I just went out there with just skate stick and, and skated around, felt pretty good. So, um, I had a fracture, like a, a puncture fracture of my right tibia, uh, but the bone around it was okay. So you just couldn't twist and and do things like that. But I could actually weight bear fairly soon after uh, the crash. But my left, with the screws in it, I couldn't weight bear for for a significant amount of time. But things were progressing. I was doing my checkups. And then um, I started skating just a couple times on my own. And then the flames called. Uh, The flames called. They're like, okay, we're having a training camp uh, mid-September. We'd just like to bring you in and keep an eye on you and i was like well do you want me to bring my equipment they're like well you're skating already and i was like yeah i've been skating just on my own no contact or anything like that but just this is september the accident's yeah, in july september, yeah yeah and so uh so i i brought uh i brought a week's worth of clothes and uh i ended up staying around for 11 years like it was i i showed up things kind of kept progressing and they kept me around and you know like they had again they, our team wasn't very good um they ended up signing me to a contract like at the right at the end of training camp and then I kind of continued 
on progressing. And then I went down for conditioning for two weeks to St. John, New Brunswick. And that's when I first started playing, playing games. And it's actually one of the coolest kind of experiences we were playing uh, Dennis Bonvey, oh, like yes, tough guy. Yes. He was, I forget what team we were playing, Great but guy. he was on, he was Wilkes on there. Barry. Yeah. And, uh, and we're lined up and he's like, Hey kid, you're the one that got in that crash. Right. And stuff. I'm like, yeah, goes, I'm, I'm proud of you. Like good job for yeah. like just, he's, he's supposed to be, I've met him briefly, but he is supposed to be one of the greatest dudes to ever. Well, I, I believe it. Like as a, as a young kid there, doesn't really, doesn't know anything. Yeah. And now you'd expect him to, work to go, there. I'm going to kick your ass. Yeah, exactly. That, that's what I was expecting. And, and for him to, to say that I, I was, you know, I still remember it to this yeah. day. It was very kind of a pretty special, yeah. special moment for me on, uh, on the ice. And then, yeah, I kind of continue to, to progress and, and play. So talk us into the first game. Who yeah, was it so, against and so, what was the... So yeah, get get called up uh, after that. Well, uh, before the AHL debut. Yeah. Because I went and I took a look. Only 24 minutes of ice in your first game. <laughs> so it's really good that they took it easy on you. We're just going to easy, <laughs> easy in there, right? October 15th. July 4th is the accident. 24 minutes, Wilkes-Barre. Get out there, kid. Let's yeah. go. See what you got. Not bad. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember that part. I was just, maybe I was just so excited to... To be back, uh, I think Rick Vive was the coach or something. He was a real <laughs> character too, but um, yeah, well, I forget how many games played. Uh, uh, St. John in in kind of leading up into the winter isn't the nicest place to be, that's for sure. So I was kind of motivated to get out there and get get at it, uh, and then got called up and we were on the road. We we're on the road and uh, Ottawa like was the first city I remember being in. Good team and at that point. Ottawa and and actually so went through pregame skate and uh, uh, I think it was Brian Sutter was the coach I've, I've been through a bunch of Sutter so sometimes I get them mixed up but Brian was the coach there at the time and he comes to me after the pregame skate says kid you're not playing can you skate with the with the black aces the extras you know and that yeah no problem so I'm out there skating getting uh, getting bag skated after that and then for I don't know what reason after I was done skating, he came to me. He's like, uh, actually, we decided to put you in today. You're playing. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. Back to that, maybe really easing me in yeah, there, yeah. right? Um, let's pressure test this kid. So, uh, so I, I only found out after the, the pregame skate and, and the skate after that. So too, too late for mom and dad to be able to fly, fly in from Saskatoon and uh you know couldn't sleep at all in the afternoon no. tried to sleep couldn't sleep too nervous excited um you know the game i don't even remember if we won or lost um, I think it was a tie tie or, or okay tie, I think yeah and the, and and just the the realization of a of a dream come true was really exciting um you know don't really remember much about the game i remember more about the next game which was Hockey Night in Canada in Toronto. It was my second oh, game. And uh, Grant Fuhr, I think, was our goaltender at the time. And I remember this ha happening. It was the puck gets shot down, and uh, that was back where you had to go touch it for icing. Yeah. And I'm in a foot race with Domi. And he, we kind of, as we're coming back, I'm in front of the net, and we hook legs yeah. a little bit and, and fall. I fall. And I go sliding into like fewer hundred miles an hour and he jumps and he's got the bad knees too. I've, I'm just, I'm Humpty Dumpty, right? I've just been put together again and we're just in this big collision right into the net, uh, on, on hockey night in Canada and Ty Domi is the one that's kind of put me there. And that was like one of the times where you're like, oh, okay, this is pretty cool. Like, yeah. first of all, Jersey, are you okay? Yeah. Cause if not, I'm in yeah, deep, now deep I'm trouble. Be yeah being a, a rookie but uh yeah it was that was a very very cool way to start uh start my career and then you remember things like first goal here in calgary at the at the saddle dome jeff chance won it back to me mom and dad were in the stands and uh ripped a ripped a fi uh, five hole wrister through uh mike vernon's legs i think he was in san jose at the time 
So anytime I, I see Vernie, I get to call him a Civ. Were mom and yeah. dad able to make your second game in Toronto? No. Isn't that no. weird? Like, I, I, no. I don't have a criticism of it because my parents were the same. Where I, They weren't. My parents didn't see a game of mine for months. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, really cool thing, what the Flames did was uh, because uh, in the contract, there was actually supposed to be the ability for them to come to the first game because, but with logistics and stuff couldn't yep. do that so what we talked to the flames about was coming on the road to check out another team and they they chose pittsburgh which the flames agreed to they chose pittsburgh and so uh that was when uh, lemieux uh yager stevens were still together and right at the kind of tail end of yeah. their career um and it was it was interesting because francis uh, would have been there still i or would think he gone to carolina it doesn't uh, matter sorry uh, keep going but what uh funny thing so they they used to always have the, all the keys together when you went into the to the hotel for the lobby. Yeah. You grab your keys yeah. and and that and back roommates and stuff like that. Well, what happened was my parents had got there early and they went to check into their room. <laughs> and so <laughs> sharing with I, I I had I'd got there after and so I grabbed my key. Well, what I didn't know was I actually came open the door and they'd given my parents like my room. Yeah. And then when I was, so, and they were already in bed. So like, I, I looked around and what the, who's like, first of all, I'm like, there's somebody in here. <laughs> and I, I look around and then I figured, figured, it figured was. out it was them. Like, thank goodness they weren't doing other things. Yeah. Cause I, that was <laughs> going, ah, yeah. yeah. But like, oh, I la like, I laugh about it after. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they they so there a, bit of, to get a room. Bit, bit of a mix up there. Yeah, it's kind of funny these things they kind of pop pop in here. But yeah, I think um, the the Penguins that line just absolutely went off. I don't, thank goodness I I don't think I had to play against them. But Lemieux had like one and four. Yager had like three and two, and Stevens had whatever. Right? Yeah. Like, it was just it was really really fun. But those those little moments like playing against some of those guys, you get that realization like this is really cool. Like I'm getting a chance to, to do what I've always wanted to do, getting a chance to play against these players that I, I grew up watching. Like th those are really interesting, really cool moments I found. Yeah. Those are those stories where you're a small town kid from Saskatchewan and you've, you're on the ice with yeah. the big boys now. Yeah. Outdoor dental dentistry with no needles, no drills and no stress. Dr. Jay Patel decided a few years ago that it was time to change the dental experience for his patients. Introducing the Solea Laser. This laser treatment is pain-free, will leave you feeling relaxed and comfortable. In addition, the laser is used to treat sleep apnea by increasing the tension of the soft palate to reduce snoring. In just two 15-minute treatments, you could be getting the amount and quality of sleep that you've been missing out on. Visit their website for more information and to book a consultation, outdoor.dental. That website again, outdoor.dental. Vina Nova is Calgary's lab-grown diamond specialist. They're the only store in Calgary that specializes exclusively in lab-grown diamonds. You know you're getting the largest selection of loose lab-grown diamonds and jewelry in the entire city. Savings from lab-grown diamonds can be as much as 80% off. Visit vinanova.com or check them out in their downtown showroom on the second level of Stephen Avenue Place. What is a lab-grown diamond? Well, lab-grown diamond, simply a diamond that's been grown in a lab. They have the same chemical composition and crystal structure as natural earth mined diamonds. Due to its identical nature, lab created diamonds have the same hardness, right? Refraction and pretty much the same as a natural diamond. Only difference, they're lab created and referred to as synthetic because they are chemically and physically the same, but are man-made. Be confident knowing you can save up to 80% compared to mine diamonds pretty much across the board. You want a custom design done? Vina Nova can do that as well. Just give them a few weeks of heads up to complete your custom piece. Find out more at vinanova.com. I've asked you about it a number of times and you, was there a point where, or what was your, your mindset? Like I'm, I'm here for now, but maybe it's St. John again, or was there a point where you were confident enough? I'm, I'm here and I'm, I'm good enough to stay here now. So first year was, was good. Like it was okay. I think it was my, is it my second or third year? I struggled and I got healthy scratched. I think once one or two games or a few games. Um, I think Greg Gilbert was the coach at that time. And um, 
it was a, was Brad McCurman here already or not? But he like, he came up and just said, you know, what do you what do you think? And I was like, well, I'm not playing that well and that. And he's like, yeah, you're you know you're saying all the right things. He's like, well, what do, what do we need to work on? This is what we think. This is, and you just put the work in. Like, have a good try to have a positive attitude or good attitude, and and don't just say, well, the coach hates me, and phone your agent and say, oh, I want to get traded. Like, figure it out. Today's like. World you know, back to adversity, right? Like, okay, I'm not playing well, like I need to get to work here and figure this out. And so kind of grinding through that. And then after I did that, then I felt like I'm an established NHLer. So it's, it's a, it's kind of an evolution of I want to make the NHL. Everything's new and exciting, uh, new cities, playing new teams, all, all that kind of stuff. And then after that, I found like, okay, now I want to establish myself as an NHLer, and then, and, and be in that conversation all the time. So you kind of work at that. And then what are the goals after that? Well, now we want to get to the playoffs. I want to be in the Stanley cup playoffs. So you work towards that. And then I want to win. And so those kind of goals move as, as the, the career kind of evolves that's the way it, it was for me. And then the other thing too, is like kind of five year increments of that, that new and exciting five years that, well, this isn't as new and exciting anymore in that middle kind of five years. And then the last five years, like this isn't going to last forever. Like uh, try to make the most of it and enjoy it. And, and, you know, you have kids around and you're bringing them to the rink and stuff like that. So it actually changed, um, the things that I enjoyed uh, about hockey a lot too, as you know, kind of life changes as well. You mentioned Brad McCrimmon. It was one of the names I had jotted down. I wanted to ask you about. He was always very complimentary. I think he was always very proud of you. The beast. One of the, everybody's yeah. one of their favorite guys in hockey. You're just one of the oh, greatest guys yeah. going. Just your relationship with him. Brad was was fantastic. He was uh, so Brad was one heck of a defenseman really, really good defenseman and had lots of success. What I really liked about him was um, the details. He really focused on the details with us. And one thing, for example, was stick placement. He was always harping on me, stick placement. Have your stick on the ice, but not just have it on the ice, have it out on the puck. Don't just have it in the lane, have it out towards the puck as much as you possibly can to close down as many lanes, as many options for that, for that player. And initially you're like, okay, like, uh, and then you do it and then you're like, oh, well that's, that puck just hits your stick. The puck, and you know, and and, it's so limiting for what they can do with it. it. Exactly. And it, and it just sounds so simple, but yet it's very effective. Um, and then one of the, uh, one of the interesting things later on in my career, uh, there was this big book of, of NHL like that and we're flipping pages one day in the training room and there's brad mccrimmon in the photo and this forward is trying to go around him and he's not letting him and his his stick is out and literally right on the puck (laughs) and it was like you know i i love that because he did it like he's not just saying it he he did it and i like i I love that i love that about him um, he was an, he was an amazing guy. He was, he was a guy that could stand up to a coach. Like he, he was a guy that stood up to Mike Babcock, for example, like to buffer Mike Babcock. And you, when you have kind of a firmer or harder coach, head coach, you need a really good assistant coach, in my opinion, one preferably that has played and has had success, um, because they're able to buffer that between the kind of the hard kind of acidity of a, of a coach like that and the players, because the players can't take that all the time and a really good assistant coach can do that. And I think Brad did a really good job of, of that. And, you know, really sad what, what happened to him and losing him in, in that plane crash in, in Russia, but he was one of the best, assistant coaches, D coaches that, that I ever had and, and a great person too. 
July 2003, trade with Buffalo. Good guys going out and one donkey coming in. What that do you been, remember about... Uh, that would have been June, not July. To the, was it June? That would have been June of... No, it was July because it was the start of Stampede. Oh, we're talking about your trade. <laughs> That's oh, the one. I'm, oh, I, I thought Buffalo my trade. <laughs> no. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, the, I, this I get donkey you. comes Sorry, to I, town. My, yeah. 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 It's like, and he's going to Buffalo. Yeah. 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 What do you... Uh, oh. Because, yeah. again, you look back, and Rhett will tell you that uh, he's responsible for uh, all playoff success, but... There was Save the Flames. He, he talked you, about it. You had not played in the playoffs up nope. until that point. Nope. Warner comes in. Sutter is here. Kiprasov looks like he's pretty good. Yeah. That was, in hindsight, a big turning point for all you guys. Yeah, it was. Uh, you know, young team, younger team, uh, great goaltender. You know, getting Mika was, was massive. Um, you know, some really good pieces, uh, skill, the Jerome. The Jerome one that I well. always, and that is underestimated in my opinion from fans and, and pundits, speed. We had a young team, but we had fast guys like Chris Clark, yep. Lombo, McCammon, Donovan. Donovan. Well, well, I think you, you realize after like, talking to opponents that uh, had come into the Saddle Dome, and, uh, you know, Daryl was harping on us for for identity and the identity what we wanted to play play with and and uh it was hard to play against you know come out fast four check physical and just pressure 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 be be responsible defensively um but just go after teams and pound them and and we did that and, and i talked to multiple players after and they said we hated coming to calgary because we knew you guys would just come out and and four check yep. us and run us and and if we were winning we we usually just fight them because we had a tough team uh too and so really like okay you yeah. you want to you want to beat us like we'll beat you up too like in that way like and there were some yeah. we had some great guys that that way too so um it was uh it was fun like it was fun hockey that way because you know that the the level level of energy um uh, in the with the team and in the in the building started uh started increasing from those first few years when i was there to um you know then qualifying for the playoffs in game 80 i think it took us to qualify for the playoffs playing the teams that we wanted to play you know daryl had had meetings with us regularly who do we who do you want to match up against um we want vancouver in the first round we think we match up well against him he agreed with us that's who we want we want vancouver in the first round and all that like he's Daryl under like he's got his limitations, but he's very good at understanding the game and also for like matchups and forecasting and who who do we think to to match up with and then and then even more granulars your line like okay I loved it when he came to me and said okay Robin you and uh jordan or you and and jay or whoever i was playing with you guys have to go out and shut down that line tonight you're playing against them like it was a personal challenge that he he would put out to you and i loved it like that was and i just felt like i responded best to to that i liked playing in a structured game for a structured coach uh, i played later on for unstructured coach and struggled like but that's what what I liked, and and we kind of started to build momentum that way, and and mo- with momentum comes belief in what you're doing, and I think you kind of saw that, and and we had a good group of veteran players, but also some leaders that had been to the playoffs and had been to the finals, and all those ingredients were were important. Yeah, you can't pick one or the other and say because you're not the same without. You miss yeah. you could take one out of the room and you miss a lot of it. So yeah. It was it was a good group. I think still the Kiprasoft, the trade is what solidified us in how yeah, we could w- play. without having a, a goaltender like that, yeah. Uh there there's no way we our team goes anywhere near uh, a run a run like that. Like he was he was a phenomenal competitor. Like he was I've never seen a guy be able to, to turn it on and off in a practice like that. Like there were times where he didn't want to practice and you could tell like he was for whatever reason. Uh, but 
but someone embarrassed them in practice and like they wouldn't score the rest of the practice. Uh, it happened in a game. Like I saw it. I, we're at, we're we had their rookie party in St. Louis, St. right? Louis and one was St. Awesome. Louis rookie party, and we're out late and and that. And but the next day in practice, like uh, Jim Playfair or some coach was okay, line everyone up because he knew like, we, we. And so we're sweating it out, and he lines everyone up on the goal line, and it's okay. Whoever's out till midnight, uh, down and back. The whole team goes down and back. Uh, whoever's out till one, right now. Okay, now there's less guys going. Uh, who's ever out past two that yeah, even less who's ever out past three even less and then next thing you know who's ever out past four five like and pretty much it's just mika skating back and <laughs> forth right and then and we're all laughing and then he's like well whoever smoked a pack of smokes and now all well, then mika bowed down and back like you know like it was it was hilarious right but the, we played um we played i think it was the day after and i forget who it was that was in the high slot and just turned around and like kind of fanned on a shot, didn't go off the ice and it went right through Mika's legs. And it was like a good second or two after it I went in that he just like, moved. I like, remember it cause yeah. I was on the bench and I remember looking and I'm like, how he didn't, he thought the puck had left the yes, zone. I'm like, like, he had, <laughs> had no clue until, until after. And I looked over at noodles on the bench after that. I'm, and noodles was looking scared, right? Yeah, you oh, might have boy, to go better, in. Better, might have to go in. The thing is, like, that completely embarrassed Mika. Like, and no one had to say anything to him or anything like that. They didn't score. I don't think the rest of the no. game. Like, he was just lights out like, the yeah. rest of the game. He's yeah. like, man, I gotta, I gotta get get yeah. going here. That was the way he was. Like, he was so competitive and had that that pride that. Uh, you know, yeah, did he have his, his issues? Yeah, he did. But when it came down to playing and wanting to win and competing, he was Yeah, awesome. I'll call his issues vices. Okay. He had his there vices. You. Yeah. <laughs> hey, guys, it's Pinder. Let's check in with our Betway bet of the day. I'm going to go big-time futures bet here. We're talking NHL Stanley Cup 2024. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, next year. Who's been well run and always kind of hanging around? Well, how about the Carolina Hurricanes? I see lots of good teams out there. Clearly, Colorado's in the mix. Toronto skilled Edmonton. No good odds on any of those teams. How about 14 to 1 for the Carolina Hurricanes, who are apparently sniffing around Eric Carlson? Would you like to add a little offensive pop to Carolina and maybe partner him with one of the best defensive defensemen in the NHL? Carolina can do that. And if they do, and you got him at 14 to 1, you're singing, baby. That's our Betway bet of the day there you go buddies that is part two of our sit down with robin regear the three the three parter i know what you're thinking it's uh three parts eh? but uh i think you can tell there's there's a lot of meat in that bone he's got us everyone has a story and and robin is no different pretty interesting and compelling stuff i to be honest i knew that robin was in the accident i remember hearing about it back in the day and to hear him I guess what just doing the prep for it, kind of going through and seeing the 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 specifics and the, the you know the particulars on it takes you back and maybe some things in there you didn't realize and maybe if you heard that for the first time you had no idea that Robin was involved in that, um, but to see and hear the emotion there, obviously you know, emotional for all of us. I'm I'm an emotional guy as you can tell, but it's hard. Um, but the strength that you see there in a guy that is able to not just physically but emotionally be able to not literally walk away but to to move on as quickly as he did i had no idea until i got looking at it that how how short the time was between the car accident and him getting back on the ice it, pretty amazing uh, you get the feeling that it was not as easy maybe as robin made it sound either way mentally or physically but i think it's safe to say it takes a pretty special person to be able to move on with their life like he did. So that's part two. Coming up, part three, from a flame to a saber to a king. Seeing the end of the career on the horizon, dealing with the body that's continuing to kind of break down little by little, and uh, the potential reality that that game seven in 2004 might be as close as he ever got to lifting a Stanley Cup. That is all on the way 
pretty good part three coming up support the sponsors thank you for supporting us part three coming up tomorrow and uh if you if you miss part one and two if you, obviously if you miss part two i don't know how you're listening right now um go back and grab part one if you and be ready for part three it's uh, it's pretty good stuff looking forward to bringing you part uh, part three coming up tomorrow on the youtubes on the apple on the spotify wherever you're getting this it's coming up tomorrow as the uh, summer vacation editions of Barnburner continue here with flamesnation.ca. Thanks, buddies.